The Vietnam War, it's over. Your job just begun. A new HBO original limited series. Welcome to the world of spycraft. Strap in. From executive producers Park Chan-wook and Robert Downey Jr. What are you concealing? Based on the Pulitzer Prize winning novel by Viet Thanh Nguyen. What if I told you that I was a communist spy? How did you become this? The Sympathizer, streaming April 14th on Max. Subscription required. Welcome everyone to the G-Note Podcast. I am your host, Jason Spicy G. Goldman, and I'm a Grammy-winning record producer, arranger, and musician. I've been a music professor at USC for over 22 years, and I am most known for writing and producing music for the iconic crooner, Michael Buble, over the past two decades. This is a podcast for musicians who want advice and strategies on navigating the music industry. If you're not a musician but a music fan, I promise there is plenty in here for you as well. On this pod, we talk all things music. On today's pod, we are asking, what's the worst anyone can say? Let's go. All right, everyone, welcome back. The, uh, as I mentioned, we are talking about what's the worst anyone could say. And uh, the worst anyone can say is no. Uh, I'm not great on remembering great phrases or sayings, but this is a saying my dad has always said to me, And it still holds true to this day. Every time I'm worried about asking for something, I always remember him saying that to me. You know, what's the worst they can say? I was lucky enough to go to the Berklee College of Music uh, for my undergraduate degree. Uh, I was there from 93 to 98 and did a dual major degree in jazz composition and and film composing. And originally, it was just jazz composition until I got to like my junior year. And then I realized, man, I really need to figure out how I'm going to make a living because no one had really posed that question to me. And I just knew that I loved film music. So I decided to dual major in film scoring uh, starting my junior year. Berkeley originally had a lot of great jazz musicians coming in and out of there. And I was at the tail end of that era when Berkeley was pretty much known as a jazz school. When I went there, there were still quite a lot of really killing jazz musicians. I had a great time at Berkeley, and unlike many who go there, I actually graduated. <laughs> I remember at the convocation, <laughs> they said, you know, it was, it was all of our freshmen there, and, and uh, whoever was giving the speech, I don't remember, said, you know, it's great to see so many of you here. Only if about 50% of you will actually graduate. <laughs> and, I, and it was pretty remarkable. My parents were there too, and my mom was just completely stunned um, because a lot of students either, you know, didn't take music serious and they didn't finish, uh, or they went on the road with a band because they got picked up early. Um, There's lots of different reasons, but this school um, didn't have a high rate of graduation. So one of my Greatest passions is my love of big band jazz music. That, that's what I do, right? As, as everyone knows who listens to this pod, I do a lot of work with Michael Buble, and a lot of that has been arranging the, this, the songs from the Great American Songbook, right, for crooners, right? Buble, Buble is really the last remaining big crooner. It's really at the core of what I do. I still remember the first jazz song I ever heard that got me into the music. I was at my friend Pat's house and we were in, I think we were in middle school at the time, and he had gotten one of those five disc changers, right? Because we were still listening to, well, we still, we were listening to CDs. That was like the big new thing at that time. Uh, and it was the first time I saw a five disc changer, right? You could put five discs in and then it kind of rotated like a little carousel. And uh, Pat said to me, man, you got to check out this trumpet player. And he proceeded to put on uh, Doc Severinsen and the Tonight Show Band. It's an album that they did uh, playing the American classic uh, Begin the Begin, which is a really popular song for American Songbook. For those that don't know, Doc was an incredible trumpet player. He was the leader of the Tonight Show uh, Band when Johnny Carson was the host. The, the house band was, believe it or not, a 17-piece big band. Uh, I still can't believe it to this day. As a matter of fact, if you go back even earlier, 
it used to be like full big band with strings and everything when Nelson Riddle, um, who was a big arranger for Sinatra, used to conduct um, the house band on Rosemary Clooney's show. So Doc is known for his incredible trumpet sound and the fact that he can play high notes on the trumpet. And if you're a trumpet player, you, you, know, you love high notes usually. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult. Playing high notes on the trumpet is hard and very few can do it well. So my friend Pat played me the song and Doc plays the melody towards the back half of the tune up the octave and I was in awe. The band was so good, super swinging, and Doc was incredible. And from then on, big band was my music. Here's a quick snippet so you get the idea of what I'm talking about. Damn, that is some good trumpet playing. I still love that band and love the way they play this tune. Fast forward all the way to my fourth year at Berkeley, and I had gotten into heavy modern jazz big band music, which is kind of what ends up happening. You know, you start with classics and you end up doing this heavier, more um, through composed music that's more concert music than it is for dancing. And in particular, I was in love with the music of pianist Jim McNeely. Jim was the house, the in-house pianist and uh, composer in residence for the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra, which plays every Monday night still to this day since 1968, I believe, or 66, one of those two, uh, when it used to be the Thad Jones Mel Lewis Big Band, and then Thad left and it was the Mel Lewis Big Band, and now it's the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra now that they both um, have passed. And I really love Jim's music, and I wanted to play it badly. So while I was at Berkeley, I had formed my own 15-piece big band, and I was trying to find a way to get Jim up to Berkeley to do a master class and perhaps do a show with my big band. Now, Jim lived in New Jersey, and, you know, Berkeley is in Boston, for those that don't know. So it wasn't really inconceivable, you know, it's not like it's a huge flight. He could even potentially drive to Boston if he was interested. But I knew it was going to cost a decent amount at that time, at least $1,000 for his fee to get him to do like a master class rehearsal on the show. Plus, we had to pay for his hotel and gas or train ticket, whatever he chose. So while at Berkeley, I had gotten a reputation for being a decent player uh, and a really good writer. And I became friendly with a guy named Joe Smith, who was the head of the professional writing department back then. Uh, this was probably right around, I think it was like 97, 1997, 96 maybe. After a long conversation with my dad about, you know, I was on the phone with him and I was talking to him about, you know, I really want to do the show with Jim. And he said, isn't there someone at Berkeley you could ask? And I remember saying, well, why would Berkeley give me the money to get a guest artist for my big band? And he said, well, why not? He said, you worked, you work hard, you get good grades. What's the worst that they could say? No, at least you will have asked. So the next day I set up a meeting with Joe and we spoke about this. And I pitched the idea of bringing Jim up to do a master class for the school, do a rehearsal and show with my big band for Berkeley. And I also mentioned, because I figured you know, while I'm asking, I might as well go for it all. I also mentioned taking the big band down to my old high school in Connecticut, Norwalk High School, to do a master class and a show there as well. So I'd have to pay for the 15 musicians to travel down by car, giving them gas money and a place to stay and food. Um, so I went for broke and I, and I pitched the whole idea to Joe. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. 
So I came up with a budget, which I rec- if I recall correctly, was about $2,500, which, you know, thinking about it now, it's like, man, what a bargain. But, and I was really nervous about it, but I did, you know, I did lay out what everything was going to cost. Jim's fee was a thousand at the time. Again, this is a long time ago. Thousand. Um, his night at a hotel. So one night stay at a hotel, his train ticket. Um, and then I also budgeted money for the people driving to Connecticut, the, you know, the students that were in my band and for us to stay at a hotel down there. Matter of fact, maybe it was more than $2,500. I, I can't remember. But I'm just thinking about it now. You know, we were staying like, I think it was like four to a room, I think, or something like that. And so I, I went into the off, his office and I pitched them the whole idea. And, you know, and I was incredibly nervous about it because, again, like I was just prepared for a big no. Sorry, we don't have the money. Uh, you know, thanks. We appreciate it. You are, you know, we, we know we really like your music, but right. All the typical things that you hear from people when they don't really want to support something or or can't, legitimately can't. But lo and behold, Joe said, let me go through your proposal and I'll get back to you. So Joe calls me, I think it was like two or three days later. And he said, we can do it. And I was just like in shock. I was like, really? <laughs> And he said, yeah, he's like, we can, we can make it happen. Again, Jim McNeely was a noted, uh, it still is to this day, noted one of the best big band, modern big band arrangers uh, and composers in the world. And so it was to Berkeley's benefit to, of course, to bring him up to do a master class. But more importantly to me was that Joe saw that I was really serious. Serious enough to put together a budget Seriously enough to ask for exactly what I wanted and to have details for him, right? He already knew I got good grades and I was already in the best big band there. Um, and he knew I had a big band. And he believed that this would be good probably for Berkeley, but more so for my career. And to be honest with you, it really, really was. Jim McNeely ended up coming up and playing with my big band, and we did a show of his music with, of course, one or two of my charts thrown in there as well. We even went down to Connecticut and did a clinic and performance, as I mentioned, and it was one of those moments where I felt that if you want something bad enough, you, you make sure all your ducks are in order, and you be ultra-professional and organized. And you, you guys know who've listened to the pod I talk a lot about being organized and professional, right? Easy to work with. We, these are my main things. It's one of those things that if you want it bad enough and you are ready to roll, people want to help. Most people and institutions want to support projects and students. The truth is most students don't have the initiative to put something like this together half the time they can't even put a, a, a quartet together and, and put a budget together and figure all this out. Believe it or not. And then they just don't, quote unquote, get around to it. Well, I got around to it for 15 musicians in a band and I wanted it bad enough and Joe, luckily enough, saw that. And I was rewarded with one of those moments that I won't forget, which is I, I got a master composer arranger to come play with my personal big band. This was not a college band. I put this band together. Got a, a musician of that caliber to come up, play with my big band specifically, and then take my band down to Connecticut, which again, from Berkeley was about, a, uh, you know, about a two hour drive. Got everyone down there, put them up at a motel, fed them all, and came back. And so the end result is, my dad was correct. The worst anyone could say is no, so you might as well ask. Because in this case, the answer was yes, and it certainly helped my career. Folks, don't sit on the sidelines. Be a player. 
Be organized. Be ready for an opportunity. And if there is no opportunity, create an opportunity. People genuinely do want to help. They really do. And I, and I know my wife always says I'm, I'm really optimistic. But I truly believe that they do want to help. And you just need to make sure that you are prepared and ready to go for the opportunity that, that you create. And lo and behold, things will good things will come to you. I promise. Folks, we have come to the end of this episode. Uh, and that's all the time we have for today. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this pod so you can stay up to date with new shows, giveaways, and more importantly, and I know you're standing with me in your head, the concerts. Everyone, we want to see you at the concerts. Come out and watch the big band. I promise you're going to have a great time. We're always at Vibrato Jazz uh, Club here in LA. So if you are here, uh, come on out. And if you want to make a special trip, we'd love to see you. You can also follow me on Instagram at Spicy G Music or check out my website jasongoldmanmusic.com to see what projects I'm currently working on and to see when I'll be performing next. Thanks so much for listening, everyone. Much love. Peace. Hey, this is Liberty DeVito. This is Mike Del Judas. This is Michael Cavanaugh from Broadway's Moving Out. This is John Jackson, director of the Billy Joel Archive. This is Russell Jabbers. This is Richie Canada, and you're listening to Glass Houses, a Billy Joel podcast. It's awesome. I'm Michael Grosvenor. And I'm Jack Fernino. We're lifelong Billy Joel fans who launched a podcast in 2020 celebrating the music we love. Whether you're looking for the greatest hits or the B-sides and rarities, you'll find it all here. And if you've ever wondered what happens behind the scenes of a concert or recording session, we've got you covered. Join us as we explore albums, tours, band members, the latest news, and more. You'll also get a unique glimpse into the music industry straight from the musicians and other professionals who help make it all happen. Tune into Glass Houses, a Billy Joel podcast at Glasshouses pod.com or wherever you get your podcasts glass houses a billy joel podcast is a proud member of the pantheon podcasts network